Everybody should do in their lifetime sometime two things. One is to consider death, to observe skulls and skeletons, and to wonder what it will be like to go to sleep and never wake up. Never. That uh, is the most, is a very gloomy uh, thing for contemplation, but it's like manure. Just as manure fertilizes the plants and so on, so the contemplation of death and the acceptance of death is very highly generative of creative life. You get wonderful things out of that. And the other thing to contemplate is to follow the possibility of the idea that you are totally selfish. That you don't have a good thing to be said for you at all. You are a complete, utter rascal. <laughs> now, the, the Christians have avoided this. Because although they say in their Episcopalian form of confession that we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep and we have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts, too much, you know, uh, we have offended against thy <laughs> holy laws, we have left undone those things which we ought to have done and we have done those things which we ought not to have done and there is no health in us. But <laughs> it ought to be different and we're going to do our best to amend with the help of God's grace. And that is a real con act because uh, if you equate health with genuine love and perfect unselfishness, then in that sense there is no health in us when we look at ourselves from this point of view. Now, when you go deeply into the nature of selfishness, what do you discover? You say, I love myself, I seek my own advantage. Now, what is the self that I love? What do I want? And that becomes an increasingly ever-deepening puzzle. Now, I've often referred to this when you say to somebody else, I love you. It's always rather disconcerting to the person to whom you say that. If you imply that you love them with a pure, disinterested, and holy love. They automatically suspect it as being a little bit phony. But if you say, I love you so much I could eat you, that's an expression, it's a way of saying to a person, you attract me so much that I can't help it. I'm absolutely bowled over by you, I'm gone. And people like that then they feel they're really being loved, that it's absolutely genuine. But now, I love you so much I could eat you. Now what the devil do I want? I certainly don't want to eat the girl in the sense of literally devouring her, because then she'd disappear. <laughs> ah, but I love myself. And what is me? How do, in what way do I know me? when it suddenly occurs to me that I know me only in terms of you. See, when I think of anything that I know and that I like, then it's always something that can be viewed as other than me. I can never get to look at me, real me. It's always behind. It's always hidden. And I really don't know it well enough to know whether I love it or not. Maybe I don't. Maybe it's an appalling man. And that the main task of the psychotherapist is to do what he called to integrate the evil. To, as it were, put the devil in us in its proper function. Because, you see, it's always the devil, the unacknowledged one, the outcast, the scapegoat, the bastard, the bad guy, you see, the black sheep of the family. It's always from that point, that which we could call the fly in the ointment, you see, that generation comes. In other words, uh, in the same way as in the drama, uh, to have the play, it's necessary to introduce a villain. It's necessary to introduce a certain element of trouble. So, in the whole scheme of life, 
there has to be the shadow because without the shadow there can't be the substance so this is why there is a very strange association between crime and all naughty things and holiness you see holiness is way beyond being good good people aren't necessarily holy people a holy person is one who is whole who has as it were reconciled his opposites and so there's always something slightly scary about holy people and other people react to them in very strange ways they can't make up their minds whether they're saints or devils and so holy people have throughout history always created a great deal of trouble along with their creative results Let's take Jesus for example trouble that Jesus created is absolutely incalculable <laughs> think of the Crusades the Inquisition the heaven only knows what's gone on in the name of Jesus very remarkable Freud's a big troublemaker Jung had a tremendous humor and he knew that nobody can be completely honest that you will try and you'll have a great deal of success in uh, exploring your motivations and your dark unconscious depths but there will be a certain point at which you will say well I've had enough of that <laughs> <You know? laughs> and do you see how in a strange way there's a certain sanity in that when a person indulges in a certain kind of duplicity of deception there is something you all laughed when I said that there was something humorous about it and this humor is very funny thing basically humor is an attitude of laughter about oneself there is malicious humor or which is laughing at other people but real deep humor is laughter at oneself now why fundamentally do you laugh about yourself what makes you laugh about yourself isn't it because you know that there is a big difference between what goes on the outside and what goes on the inside <laughs> that if I hint you see that your inside is the opposite of your outside it makes people laugh if I don't do it unkindly if I get up in the attitude of a preacher and say uh, you're a bunch of miserable sinners and you ought to be different nobody laughs, <laughs> but if I say well after all boys will be boys and girls will be girls and we, we all know then, then, then people laugh now you see what's, what's happening when we do that now I passed you around a lot of embroidery to look at before we started and I'm perfectly sure that you got the point that there's a big difference between the front and the back <coughs> in some forms of embroidery the back is very different from the front because people take shortcuts in the front everything is orderly and it is supposed to be kind of messy on the back side see which side will you wear you've got to be sure you get the front in the front the have the back in the back the back has all the little tricks in it all the shortcuts all the low down that people don't acknowledge you see and it's exactly the same with the way we live you know like sweeping the dust under the carpet in a hurry just before the guests come I mean we do ever so many things like that and if you don't do it if you don't think you do it and you think well really I my embroidery is the same on both sides see well you're deceiving yourself because what you're doing is you're taking the shortcuts in another dimension which you're keeping out of consciousness everybody takes the shortcuts everybody plays tricks everybody has in himself an element of duplicity of deception because you see from this point of view that I'm discussing where the web is the trap to be is to deceive think of camouflage 
the chameleon who changes its colour. Think of the butterfly pretending it has eyes. Think of the flower saying to the bee, like my honey. <laughs> the bee says, wow. <laughs> but then that means that the bee has to be, and it has to go on living, and all the trouble it takes to go around collecting honey and raising other bees and organizing itself and doing that dance which tells the other bees where there's more honey. There's all that stuff to do. But the flower was deceptive. Now, in the same way, I've often said, life is, is a drama, and a drama is a deception. It's a big act. When you peel an onion and you don't really understand the nature of an onion, you might look for the pit in the center, like any ordinary fruit has. But the onion doesn't have a center. It's all skins. And so when you get right down, there's nothing but a bunch of skins. You say, well, that was a kind of disappointing. <laughs> but of course you have to understand that the skins were the part that you eat well in rather the same way you see you find when you explore yourself uh, and your motivations and you go through and through and you try to find out that thing which is really genuine that's why in Zen discipline they give you koans which require a perfectly genuine act an act of total and absolute sincerity and people knock themselves out trying to do this thing, but they always know that the master's going to catch them. Because he reads their thought. You know that story of um, von Kleist, about the man who had a fight with a bear, and the bear could read his thoughts, so that the only way of hitting the bear was to do so not on purpose. Because the bear would know in advance. So it's the same in working with a Zen master. You have to do the genuine act not on purpose. But since you are put in a situation where it's rather formal and you're supposed to do it on purpose, you're stuck, you see. So you explore the onion and you go in and in and in and then you find, well, uh, it's all a deception. Now then the question arises, who's deceiving who? Who's fooling who? I'm fooling me? What is fooling? Fooling is playing like you're there when you're not. You know, getting somebody else to answer your name in the roll call. <laughs> so, we're all, you see, this is the metaphysical basis of it. This is what the Hindus mean by maya, the world illusion. The world is playing it's there when it isn't. And it's a trap. And it sucks you in. And you can't get out of it. And it's a thorough big trap too. But always when you get an idea like this or a feeling like this, follow it to its extreme. Don't back out from it. If you find you're selfish, go to the extreme of what selfishness means. Confusion largely results from not following feelings or ideas to their depth. You know, people think they want to be immortal. They'd like to live forever. Do you really want to do that? Think about it. Really go into it, what it would be like. People say they want this, that, and the other. They want this kind of car, they want this kind of dress, or so on, and um, this much money, and so on. It's always a good idea to think it right through. What it would involve to be in that situation, to have those desires fulfilled. Also, when you form a relationship to another person, think it through, too. You see? How inconvenient could they be? <laughs> However attractive. And uh, always turn the em embroidery round and look at the underside, but don't get caught doing it. <laughs> See, that's something one does on the side, in secret, because otherwise you play the game that everything is as it's supposed to be on the front. But that makes you humorous, and that makes you human. 